Welcome, welcome, welcome to Above Replacement Radio. I am your host, Chris Gianta. I might be becoming a bad baseball fan who can't enjoy the romantic things because of advanced statistics. 15 years from now, I want to be on the early baseball committee. Over there on the other side of the screen is Daniel Curran. I literally have the fan graphs hoodie. The baseball reference t-shirt is repping some stats, you know what I'm saying? It's not necessarily Hall of Fame. It's not necessarily above average, but we can guarantee you we are better than just the standard replacement level college sophomore. And welcome to Above Replacement Radio. We're talking baseball kind of whenever I'm your host, Chris Gianta, over there. On the other side of the screen is Daniel Curran. How you doing, Daniel? Chris, I am doing very well today. It's the first show uh, after a week. We had to take a, a bit of a break uh, during the week. Uh, I a couple of days ago because i've been i've been very busy and i know you've been very busy with wrapping up your internship and i've been busy with mine but uh we're back today and uh it's the end of june we're we're, we're real like it, it hit me how far into the season we are uh it's pretty scary honestly it feels like it's gone by very quickly yeah uh absolutely it is it, it, it hits me every year um that we're like we're at this point it's like oh wow like they just do this one. They just do what they just did one more time. And then the season's over. Um, yeah, we're, we're almost at the halfway mark. Teams are approaching around 80 games right now. So, yeah. Uh, and, you know, all star all star starters or all star starter finalists have been announced already. Um, so, yeah, yeah, like that's, you know, we're getting into getting into the uh, dog days of summer almost. Yes, we are. Um, and. You know, it's a time where the standings are a little more relevant. You know, it's not being a division leader right now is not completely uh, is not completely, you know, I guess uh, vain or just, you know. Unless not, you are the not, Minnesota Twins, of course, unless of course. you're the unless you're the Twins or, or but, maybe the Cincinnati Reds. Yes, but uh, either way, um Either way, you know, if you're if you're if you lead the division at the end of the year, you get a free ticket to the playoffs. And, uh, you know, we're at that point in the year where that's kind of a relevant thing. We're looking at it. We're looking at, uh, you know, what teams are going to do at deadlines and uh, a team that we figured would be, you know, definite sellers, maybe not knowing what they would sell off, but definite sellers at this point um, would be the Cincinnati Reds. But they went on. And they decided to win 11 games in a row. That streak is still ongoing. Uh, we talked about them last week, but because they've kept their streak up, uh, we have to talk about them again. Um, what have you been thinking about the Cincinnati Reds as of late? Yeah, I mean, I can tell you right now, if you listen to our last episode, you know that uh, ARR now has a resident Reds fan uh, in Brian Butler. And I can tell you that the, the vibes in, in my house have been very high. The Reds have won, uh, what eleven in a row now? Yeah, is that is that what their streak is? Yes. Yeah, uh, it's the longest win streaks they've had since the nineteen fifties. Um, and I mean they're, they're just you know they're finding a way in every game. You know they're not they've there have only been really a few games where they've just crushed their opponents. Uh, everything else they're kind of playing close games, one to two run ball games. That's what most of the streak has been. Uh, but they're just finding finding a way whether it's you know comfortable behind victories against the Rockies or even the Astros on the road. Uh, they're just, no matter what the competition is, no matter what the situation is, they are always finding a way. And that's kind of what they've just been doing during the streak. Yeah, that is a, that is a very accurate way to describe it because uh, yeah, during this 11 game win streak, um, eight games have been decided by two or fewer runs. Um, and you could take that multiple ways. You could say, okay, you know, run, you could pull out the run differential card, which may be a little bit bad valid uh but you could also point out you know they're they're in tight games and they're winning such tight games uh also what should be mentioned is they i mean in the middle of this they they swept the astros which is actually pretty insane yes um in houston you know, yeah in houston uh that's a pretty wild thing to do and part of the reason why the reds are winning these tight games is they're they're winning the they're winning the uh, you know important situations uh, as a team during this streak. They are hitting 323 with runners in scoring position, and they are allowing a 135 average with runners in scoring position. So they are one of the best uh, at hitting with runners in scoring position in this streak, and one of the best you know on the mound at 
you know, preventing hits when uh, they have runners with, with scoring position or runners in scoring position. Uh, as far as high leverage situations go, they're also they've also been excellent. Uh, the Reds on this winning streak have an 1148 OPS in high leverage situations, which is the second best. Uh, and they also uh, on the on the mound have a 169 slugging against in high leverage situations. So, I mean, it's completely opposite spectrum there, but in terms, which is a good thing, you know, they're they're doing extremely well at the plate in high leverage situations and extremely good on the mound uh, in high leverage situations. Yeah, I, you know, they're just like I said, they're finding a way in every situation Um, and that, you know, kind of goes beyond the numbers of it. But uh, if you want to look into the numbers of it as a team. They have a 113 weighted runs created plus during the span. They are seventh in Major League Baseball in position player F4 at 2.3. We mentioned this last show, but they've just continued to do it. They are leading the league in BSR over the span with, uh, or sorry, they are second in the league in BSR with 2.3 trailing only the Arizona Diamondbacks. Um, They're running the base as well. Um, they're, they have a 9.8% walk rate, which is among the best in the league. It is, uh, eighth in the league. Uh, so that's been fantastic. You know, they're just kind of doing the, I mean, they're doing the little things right, but they're also doing all the big things right as well. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, and you mentioned the walk rate, someone who has really been, uh, just has been really a really unique player. And I just did not forecast this at all. But Will Benson during the win streak has a 28% walk rate and an 8% strikeout rate. I I just put in a a span finder search about him specifically. Like as you were saying that I clicked get results. Um, He has a five. As we know, it's this. Oh, wow. They actually gave me the results already. Um, Yeah, he has a 556 on base percentage and 1171 OPS during the streak. Did you get anything out of that uh span finder or no? Yeah, I guess I should have foreseen this, but Joey Votto's on here quite a bit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I guess I should have seen that one coming. True. True. But I mean, either way, that I mean, Joey Votto. Joe he's... Morgan is on here a lot. Frank Robinson, Ted Klozuski. Ah, Klozuski. Uh, Ken Griffey Jr. is on here quite a bit. Interesting, interesting. Um, but yeah, Benson. Yeah, Will Benson like, is the first. Will Benson is the first Reds player not named Joey Votto since 2013, uh, with, with uh, ten plus walks and three or less strikeouts in a ten game span. Uh, it was Sin Shu Chu, the last person who did it. Right. Yeah. Um. Yeah. That sounds. That sounds about right. Uh. Yeah. Regarding. Yeah. yeah regarding Benson, I mean that. He's he's really interesting. I, I I mean I highlighted him. He's the only uh as of now the only minor league how about that that we have on record uh from last year because <laughs> he was that's true doing really well in the minors in the Guardian system last year. I think he was a first round pick back in uh 2016 at a high school. Um and yet yeah, he's finding finding himself a little bit in uh in Cincinnati and his savant page is uh. Really interesting, just looking at the chase rate. I think he's, I think his chase rate's seventeen percent right now, um, which is extremely low. That's like eleven percentage points below average. Uh, pretty wild to have those walk and strikeout numbers right now. Um, uh, other offensive players that have been, uh, you know, standing out. Uh, Jonathan India. I'm actually, one... I've actually moved on to pitching. I, I hate to jump here real quick, but it's something very interesting that I'm noticing. The Reds have a 31.6% ground ball rate as a pitching staff. That is overwhelmingly the lowest in the majors, and they play in a famously hitter-friendly ballpark. So I'm very curious, uh, you know, and they have a 3.65 ERA. So, I mean, it's working out. They do have a 1.25 home runs per nine, which is, uh, is it the most in the league? No, it's not even close, but it's uh, tied for 10th highest. Yeah, th- um, that's why... That's why I went extensively into their, you know, runners in scoring position and high leverage numbers because uh because the Reds they have a very high left on base rate in this in this span, which is why their ERA and FIP are mm-hmm. you know have a high difference. Um 
and yeah, I mean, you know, I could get in, I could get into why, like, okay, this, this streak is interesting, but there are some things that are a little, you know, you know, some things definitely going their way that are allowing the streak to happen. You know, they're, they have a, you know, they have a 169 slugging against in high leverage situations. That's, that's not going to, it's not going to really sustain itself most likely, especially considering the pitching staff right now with, you know, Lidolo and green both on the IL right now. And, you know, we weren't necessarily high on that staff uh, heading into here. Um, And, you know, they have a outside outside of like three people. Right. Um, And uh, I kind of, I dove oddly deep on the reds and like their batted ball stuff with runners in scoring position, you know, from the mound uh and you know they have i think a one they have like a 169 babip against with runners in scoring position during the streak however like they're they're creating their own luck in a way their pitchers with runners in scoring position during the streak have a 28 percent sweet spot rate against and also surprisingly enough a 13 percent pop-up rate against which is very very high i was so, actually just going to get into that the reds as a staff have a 10.6 percent pop-up rate overall during this span that's the second highest rate in the majors behind only the chicago white Sox. right so you know that can lead to having a lower babip as a staff sure you know otherwise they can still be getting a bit lucky but the the babip you know they they wouldn't necessarily have an average babip if they were getting average results on these batted balls because uh because of how many pop-ups they're inducing like that's a lot of pop-ups especially um, with runners and scoring yeah position. another note uh so the reds had as a staff have the third highest fly ball rate against uh but their average exit velocity again on fly balls is the one two three four five six seven eighth lowest uh, at 91.7 miles per hour uh it's below the league average so they are giving up a lot of fly balls but they're fly balls that kind of aren't really going anywhere yeah yeah which like i guess yeah they're more dangerous in that ballpark but they also play half their games on the road let's not forget that um so so yeah i mean it's it's a really interesting um a really interesting crew of guys and and ways of succeeding uh that they've had and i mean it's the perfect division to just have this weird streak going on because yes, no one's stepping up. I the, the Reds are stepping up. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Outside of They're the yeah, ones outside doing of that. the Reds, um, yeah, yeah. Like it's it's you know it's anyone's to take. The Reds are taking it right now. We'll see how it goes for the rest of the season. Um, I'm still keeping an eye on the Cardinals. They're they're only nine games out. Like. I don't know. They could yeah. they could go yeah. off. Yeah, only nine games out, right? <laughs> like, you know. I they don't know. They could easily They're... go on a run and, and make that up whenever they want to. Right. Um they could. It's just a, a little making it a little hard on themselves now. And their pitching staff just is is pretty rough. Um as as far as I remember. Uh so yeah, like the Reds, because of this eleven game winning streak. They are leading the NL Central. Uh, the Brewers are what, uh, like two or three games out. Um, Pirates have something like that. Yeah, Pirates have kind of lost that that magic dust. Um, they're kind of reverting back to what they were originally predicted to be, and that leaves the Cubs, who just have been kind of stagnant over the course of the year. They haven't been streaky by any means at any point this year so it's a real cast of characters in the nl central and um the reds have seemed to take control for now yeah um yeah like you mentioned hunter green and nicola dolo are upon the il uh so you could look at it as you know i mean there's really not a you know you could look at it as oh they're gonna come back down to earth soon they don't have two of their solid pitchers although Lodolo hasn't been fantastic this year, but you could also look at it as they're only going to get better, or you could look at it as, you know, they're staying afloat without two of the pitchers that they thought that they were going to be relying on this year. And I mean, they have been relying on green. He's been fantastic. 
Lodolo not as much, but I think injuries have been a large part of that. Um. Yeah, correct, correct. The bullpen is not as uh, bad as I would have predicted preseason. Like they're... No, I mean, Alexis Diaz has been tremendous this year. He's kind of picking up where his brother left off last year, if you think about it. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and there's a solid, um, solid argument to say, you know, the, that Alexis Diaz is leaving off where Alexis Diaz left off because he was also having a good year. Um, yeah, strikeout wise, he's kind of at, uh, Edwin Diaz's level right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, regarding, regarding that bullpen overall in the year, the Cincinnati bullpen is 11th in ERA. That's not on the streak. That's the whole year. Um, and, uh, their FIP doesn't trail behind a crazy amount. Um, so like, you know, the, that's, that's better when I, than what I would have predicted. I would have predicted the Reds bullpen would be like 25th in ERA at this point in the year, but they're 11th. So yeah, um, they're in a better spot than I would have predicted. So Cool stuff with the Reds. Um, we'll we'll keep an eye on them. Uh, you know the Brewers just haven't they haven't really like with with how bad the Cardinals have been. It's been on the Brewers to take control of that division, and they just haven't. So here are the Reds. Here are here are the Reds. Yeah, I mean if you if you tell me before the season, you know the Cardinals are going to be a last place team, one of the worst teams in the National League for. The majority of the first three months of the season, I think the immediate thought is, oh, Milwaukee's got to be running away with that division. And they're not. I mean, not only are they not running away with it, they're not even leading it. They're kind of hovering 500 uh, while the Reds have really taken control. So, you know, I mean, I think the Brewers, if they don't win this division, they just they kind of fumbled a major opportunity for themselves because they were really only one of two teams that was expected to be competitive this year in that division. Yeah, 100 percent. I, I agree with that 100 percent. Uh, you know, they, this is, it's a team that is only two years removed from a 95 win season where they did win that division. And, you know, right now, even with the Cardinals struggling, how they've been struggling, they're only two games above 500 and you got teams like the Reds ahead of them. It's uh, mm -hmm. very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, so yeah. Uh, another streak that happen in baseball double digit win streak uh it did end yesterday they they kind of got clobbered yesterday but i figured we should still talk about this surging team because all in all they still won 10 out of 11 even if they lost yesterday uh but the san francisco giants have been climbing up the standings uh currently ahead of the los angeles dodgers who you know they've been you know, they haven't been quite to the Dodger level, but they've still been a formidable playoff contender. And the Giants are ahead of them. And the Giants, you know, won 10 games in a row. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, just... And they particularly were... During the streak, like, it, they obviously, you, you find ways to win, but they were also just absolutely clobbering teams. They I think they averaged eight runs per game and, and allowed 3.1 runs per game. Like they were just dominant on all sides. Yeah. I'm just saying uh, the San Francisco giants have virtually the same uh, record as the New York Yankees. Uh, you know, there, there's, there was some sort of connection between those two teams and uh, a very specific person they were both targeting. And, you know, one of them didn't look as attractive and one of them looked a lot more attractive and they're now they kind of look the same. Right, yeah, because I mean, right now they both don't have Aaron Judge, uh, because yeah, he's on correct. the IL. <laughs> so, yeah, and I mean, if you took away, hypothetically, if you took ju Judge's production away from the Yankees, um, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't have as many wins right now. Um, yeah, but yeah. Uh, um, going back to the Giants though, and what's what's been working for them, uh, it starts on end with that bullpen i mean that's that's what's been the biggest factor for them during this streak like i mentioned they are 10 and 1 their bullpen leads the majors in f4 during this time they have a 251 era overall as a staff that is the best in the major leagues they have a 312 fip uh they have 
you know, they have, first of all, they've uh, allowed the least amount of home runs per nine, which is fantastic. Uh, and it's really just been a full group effort. Uh, so June 6th is when this, when this started, or at least that's not, yeah, June 6th is what I'm going from. Uh, and Sean Manaya, who I believe they're having a uh, Reeve now has been fantastic. 13 and two thirds innings over four games that he's appeared in. Uh, and he had 11.2 strikeouts per nine, 1.8, 1.98 walks per nine, and then no home runs allowed. Uh, the only guys that have allowed home runs for them are Jacob Junis and uh, Keaton Wynn. But everyone else has kept the ball in the yard the entire time. They've had guys like Ryan Walker that have stepped up in seven innings pitched, Tristan Beck uh, in, in 12 innings pitched, and then there's, you know, the usuals, Taylor Rogers, Camilo Dalval, Tyler Rogers. Uh, you know, all of them have kept runners uh, from crossing the plate. Uh, I love seeing Brandon Crawford here too. I think that's awesome. Yeah. It's hilarious. Remember he pitched a few days ago when they were, uh, you know, when it was a lopsided game. So, uh, overall they've been fantastic as a unit. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the, uh, and, and during the streak specifically, they had a one eight five ERA and a two eight Oh FIP, which were both second best in the league, uh, during that 10 game stretch. Um, Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, that's, that's a, a really good, um, that's a really good asset to have, um, overall, you know, from both starters and relievers, uh, during the streak, they had the best ERA in baseball at two, six, eight, and the second best FIP at 3.32. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, like that pitching staff dominated the, their offense also dominated, they had the highest on base percentage d- during the streak at 387. They were second in walk rate with an 11% and second in weighted runs created plus with a 136, uh, and also third in expected WOBA. So they, you know, even expected numbers uh, supported their offensive tear. And along with that, they were getting it done in the, you know, clutch situations. Uh, during the win streak, the Giants were hitting 405 with runners in scoring position, and they led the entire quadruple slash line uh, with runners in scoring position. And to point out some specific offensive uh, performers, uh, during the win streak specifically, uh, that 10-game win streak, Mike Krzyzewski had a 1042 OPS in 40 plate appearances. Jock Peterson had a 444 on base percentage, 1065 OPS, and 30... Uh, 444 on base percentage, 1065 OPS in 36 plate appearances. And Lamont Wade Jr. also had a 429 on base percentage and 970 OPS in uh, 28 plate appearances. And yeah, like uh, with the Giants, part of why, you know, going back to preseason predictions, we both, you know, were even whether or not we were optimistic on the Giants or Diamondbacks, like being ahead of whichever team, they've both. Both teams have been really outperforming our expectations, both the Gi- Giants and the Diamondbacks. Um, and one of the things I said about the Giants was like, okay, I like their major league experience. And, uh, you know, guys like Yastrzemski, Peterson, and and Wade Jr., uh, you know, performing. Like, that's 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 kind of, those were kind of the people I was relying on, you know, kind of maintaining the Giants afloat, which now, at this point, they've, more than maintain the Giants afloat. I think it's cool how many guys that you like from a general baseball perspective, you probably weren't anticipating were going to be big contributors to the Giants are doing exactly that. Like Tyro Estrada, I think might be the team leader in F4 this year. If I'm not mistaken, that sounds right. Um, I, yeah, I, I know he was, he was up there just because I was searching a couple weeks ago, seeing, you know, potential, you know, for the, for the league potential replacements. If, if I were to run into a situation, but yeah, I know he was, he was definitely yeah. up there. Yeah. Um, Patrick Bailey has come up as a catcher. He was their number 11 prospect by MLB pipeline heading into this year. Uh, he's looked all right offensively, you know, expected numbers don't expect, I mean, he has a 516 expected slogging uh, and a 523 slugging. So he's lifting the ball a lot, hitting a lot of line drives, and he's also a fantastic defensive catcher so far. His pop time to second base is in the 98th percentile. His framing is in the 94th percentile. Uh, he's a 24-year-old out of uh, NC State. And he's come up this year and has made an immediate impact pretty much on all fronts. Yeah, that's 
that's pretty wild. That's that's very wild. Um, you know, the Giants the Giants have obviously it's also a switch know, hitter too. Yeah, the Giants have obviously coveted the catcher position over the past decade, you know, Buster Posey, probably a future Hall of Famer. Decade plus. Um manning the uh manning the backstop. So and and you know, like they they tried to they tried to set up the future at that position with Joey Bart. It hasn't really worked out so far. So having a guy step up like that is um you know, a real pleasant surprise just organizationally. Yeah, absolutely. Um yeah, so the yeah, the Giants, yeah, the, as they stand now, I think they're yeah, 42 and 33. They have, you know, just to double check the standings, uh, I just want to check where where exactly they're at. Um, I think there are a few games back of the D-backs who continue to, you know, continue to do well. They are three and a half games back of the D-backs, and they are um, in the, if the season ended today, they would take the five seed in the National League playoffs. Um, so... I don't know. I think there's there's. I a... love that uh, the only like constant in the NL Central, the only thing that's gone according to the is the we will play 500 ball this year, Colorado Rockies. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's the only thing that's gone according to plan. That they are 29 and 48. In case you're wondering, they are very likely not going to play 500 ball this year. But Monfort really, really was buying to it. Yeah, I was. I was totally in. Yeah, he had, I, he, I thought I I can't believe it's not working. When I go to like when I'm looking up doing prep for the show, um, just seeing what the MLB experts are looking at, I I I get the owner's word first, and then yeah. I go based I get I go based off of that. Yeah, um, but are you uh, telling me people don't? I I don't know some some of these analytics guys, they just they just go off the beaten path. I don't know yeah. what they're doing. Um, but yeah, regarding the Giants, so they're they're in a playoff spot right now. Uh I think, you know, there's there's potential here. Like they're, you know, probably buyers at the trade deadline at this point. Like that's pretty interesting. I, I don't know what they'll go after. Who is even like, like who is even selling? Right. That's that's the tough part. Like that has assets. There's like the the two obvious teams that have been struggling are the Royals and athletics and they don't really have anyone, anybody valuable. Yeah, to trade. Like everyone that the Royals have is like under a lot of team control. So you wouldn't expect them to sell. The A's have like a couple guys that have like looked pretty all right this year, like Brent Rooker, but I don't, I don't even think they would even trade him. Right. So or like that, Ryan Noda as well, but I don't know. I just don't buy it. Yeah. So even saying the giants are, buyers at the trade deadline doesn't it doesn't have a crazy meaning but um i'm wondering like yeah, what I, I don't know i'm not really sure about how this deadline is going to be this year i don't think the mets are selling but i mean if you take away you know if you take away the teams and look at the records you could make a case for them to sell but when you include the context it's just hard to imagine i don't think the mariners are selling Definitely don't think the Padres are selling. They're probably buying. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Maybe if the Pirates continue to slide, they sell. But even then, like, what are they really selling? Like, right. Rich I mean, Hill they... at 45 years old. Right. Like, they, they just extended Brian Reynolds. They're not trade. There's He's not a factor at all. No. He's... They've already extended Key Brian Hayes. Right. Yeah. They're, de- they're definitely not selling Mitch Keller, I don't think. That would be insane if they did. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, like that's Bednar, that's a team. That's a team with a, a lot of players in team control. Shout out to David Bednar for having one walk in twenty-seven innings pitch this year. That's that's pretty dope. That's awesome. That's Eight thirty-two pretty, strikeout to walk ratio. That's uh, that is definitely a amazing to. That's a lot of strike throwing right there. Yeah, love to see it. Um. But yeah, regarding the Giants, I guess going back to, you know, where they are in the standings, um, I think, yeah, the, it it's interesting to talk about them. It's interesting to just talk about them in, in the context of the National League West, because I still think everyone is waiting for, you know, both the Dodgers and the Padres to heat up. Um, you're, I have more trust in the Dodgers to get to the top than 
the Padres do than the Padres to just even get hot because they've just been such a world whirlwind the past couple of years. But you know, the Dodgers obviously seem inevitable, but the Giants as playoff contenders, um, you know, I'm not I'm not hating on it right now. Yeah. Like uh there's there's just a there's there's a there's a decent amount of good players there. Um the the Diamondbacks are obviously a little more exciting. And just looking at the rest of the playoff picture, I mean like the Marlins are at the top of that wild card uh ranks. They would they would take the four seed right now. Um, I have more faith in the Giants to keep up what they're doing than I do the Marlins. That's for sure. Um, and then when you look at below the, you know, who's out of the wild card spots right now, it's Milwaukee, Philadelphia, uh, Chicago, San Diego, and then New York with the Mets. And like the Mets are seven and a half out from what the Giants are right now. So I don't know. I like, I like what the, uh, I, I'm I'm decent with the with the Giants' chances right now, especially with how many things are, have gone right. Uh, I know they lost ten nothing yeah. yesterday, but a lot of things are going right for them. Chris, I just this is incredibly off topic, but I just found this, and I'm very, very curious to hear your thoughts. If you had to guess, how many position players have the Rays used this year? Um, I would guess uh, eighteen. They've used fourteen. Hmm. That does yeah, that doesn't seem like a lot. You put nine guys on the field every day. The Rays have used fourteen total in about seventy to eighty games. Yeah. It you uh Yeah, you typically don't see that from the Rays. They seem like a very mix and match. No. Well, it, it tells you things are working out. Like they have a reliable. They've used thirty two pitchers. Well, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> All right, and that will lead into the part that we've most prepared for uh, with our players to highlight, and we'll start with the players doing well. So for our, now for our Friday, June 23rd, 2023 edition of How About That? He's striking out less, walking more, and he's also making better contact. Turning into a strikeout machine just out of nowhere. He's been excellent all around this year. He is getting a... How about that? What an amazing intro that is, by the way. Chris, shout out to you. Great work. We have a new intro for How About That, and you're going to see hear a new one for Slightly Alarming later on. But Chris, shout out. That's that's a sick intro. Thank you. Thank you. So my How About That for today, uh, I believe I'm crossing a team off the list. Uh, I am talking about Braxton Garrett from the Miami Marlins. We've talked a lot about the Marlins. Uh, shockingly, we have another player to highlight on the good side for them, though. Uh, but Braxton Garrett has been very much that. Uh, over his last five starts, he has a 2.20 ERA and a 160 FIP. His 1.2 F4 ranks second in the major leagues, only to Blake Snell. Uh, and under this span, he has 43 strikeouts and three walks over 28 and two thirds innings pitched. Uh, this means he leads the majors in Sierra uh, at a 1.76. The next best is 2.16. So. He leads that by, uh, what, 40 points, 50 points? I can't do basic math in my head. Um, He also leads the league in XFIP. 135 is his XFIP over the span. The next pass in the majors is 1.83. So that's half a run. And he leads the majors in K rate minus walk rate uh, at 37.7%. His ground ball rate has gone from 40.6% before the span to 55.9% in this span, the seventh highest among the 114 pitchers with at least 50 batted balls. Uh, Additionally, during this span, he has a 16.7% fly ball rate, and that ranks 10th lowest on that same list. Uh, His expected weighted on base average has gone from 358 before the span to 244 in this span, the which is the fifth lowest. And that also means his expected ERA has taken that kind of dip too, because X Woba and X ERA are a one to one ratio. They are the same. Uh 37.3% of his batted balls have had a negative five degree launch angle or lower. That is the fifth highest rate in the majors. Uh, so he's been getting better contact. He's been striking guys out more, and he's been walking a lot less guys. And additionally, during the span, the usage on his cutter 
has gone from 15.3% to 24.2% in this span. And opponents are hitting 136 against his cutter, the ninth lowest among the 66 hitters with at least 10 plate appearances ending on a cutter. So, you know, we've been talking for a lot of years about how the Marlins rotation has a very bright look for the future, but we weren't really talking about Braxton Garrett being part of that equation, but he very much has been a part of that equation uh, over the last month or so. Braxton Garrett. How about that? Um, yeah, that is a uh, yeah. He's he's been excellent. Um, so excellent that uh, I also chose him as my how yeah. about that. We used we used different spans, so we will get we'll we'll get a couple different stats. Um, Perfect. And I didn't really look at uh his bad. I, I didn't really go in depth on his batted ball profile in his last. Eight starts, Braxton Garrett has a 2.00 ERA and 2.05 FIP in 45 innings pitch. Out of 80 qualifiers in this span, his ERA ranks fifth. Uh, and FIP, XFIP, strikeout minus walk rate, and SIERA all rank first out of 80 qualifiers in his last eight starts. Uh, his strikeout rate went from 19% before the span to 37% in the span. Uh, His whiff rate went from 23% before the span to 35%. Uh, Out of 131 pitchers with 200 plus swings against them in the span, his whiff rate ranks fifth. Uh, Out of 134 pitchers with 400 plus total pitches thrown, his called strike and whiff rate ranks first. Uh, Along with that, uh, the whiff rate on Braxton Garrett's slider has gone from 39% up to 51% in this span. Uh, he's gone and he has gone from throwing a slider in the zone 42% of the time to 31% of the time. Uh, he's thrown it out of the zone more and it's getting better results actually. Uh, he has gone from throwing his slider in game day zones 13 and 14, which are the lower quadrants of the zone, from 52% of the time to 68% of the time. When he throws it in those areas, he has a 33% swing and miss rate. That's not a whiff rate. That's all pitches. 33% of the pitches he throws in the in those areas gets swings and misses. And uh, along with that, Braxton Garrett has the second most swings and misses on sliders in those zones in that span. The lower quadrants, uh, the lower quadrants outside the strike zone. Uh, He's throwing that slider and he's getting a lot of swings and misses on it. He's only behind Spencer Strider in that category that I just mentioned. Uh, And then along with that, with the batted ball stuff, his average exit velocity has also gone from 92.1 miles per hour to 90.0 miles per hour. So his uh, his slider has been absolutely lethal, getting uh, getting hitters to swing and miss on half of their swings against it uh, and also getting softer contact and, you know, just getting, I mean, the highest strikeout minus walk rate and X and lowest FIP and lowest X FIP over his last eight starts is just ridiculous. He just would not predict that at all, especially a guy. I think he averages like 90 or 89 on his fast on his, on a sinker yeah, which he is does. His main fastball, which is pretty unbelievable. Like not, not the uh, highest of velocities, but he's getting strikeouts. Like he's like, he's Jacob deGrom or something. Uh, so Braxton Garrett from both of us getting a how about that? Um, so yeah, shout out to him. I before um before I knew that we uh before we knew we weren't doing the last show, I had him I had him before that, and then he went out and struck out thirteen batters yesterday. Yep. Um, yep. and I was like, I mean, it's it's like it would make sense that we would both do him, but it's like. I, I would not be able to live with myself if neither of us did him, uh, especially since mm-hmm. the Marlins were still open as a team that we haven't done. So uh, glad we were able to highlight him because he's been unbelievable. Um, so yeah. now we move. Just for from... reference, there are now, uh, I believe, six teams left on the list. Uh, ironically, we haven't done the Cincinnati Red. We've talked about them the last two shows. We have not highlighted one one of their players on this segment. We haven't done either New York team, the Yankees or the Mets. We haven't done a Philly. We haven't done a Padre and we haven't done a Cardinal. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think most of those make sense. Like the, you know, five out of those six teams are larger markets that have been or minus St. Louis, but you know, they've been higher profile teams that have kind of been underwhelming this year to some degree. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, and then that, yeah, the Reds we just straight up haven't gone to. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, the Reds, and also what's tough is just how our show is organized. Whenever we highlight a team, like there's always potential that we are highlighting a, a player on that team like later on in the show, and you don't want to go too in depth. But the other person, yeah, that's know. always a thing. Yeah, that you know, that's that's the that's the you know tricky um, tightrope that we have to walk, but with the show organization and not telling each other what our uh, players highlight are going to be, because, you know, sometimes you got to be careful. Sometimes you think you got to be careful. Yeah. It's a weird type type rope. Um, So now we moved from the highs to the lows where we will get into our Friday, June 23rd, 2023 uh, edition of slightly alarming statistics. He's been barreling up the ball way less. He's not missing bats. He's not getting the ball on the ground, and people are hitting it in the air more. It's been so bad. He is getting a... Slightly alarming. So my slightly alarming for today, you could argue this is much more than just slightly alarming. Uh, I'm talking about John Carlos Stanton of the New York Yankees, team we you know, kind of just mentioned as a team we haven't highlighted, and how about that? Um, he is hitting 089 over his last... Or since June 4th, but... I'm actually taking this one a little deeper. This goes back to July 21st of last year. Uh, mm. Since then, he is slashing 169, 248, 370, 618 for a 72 weighted runs created plus in 242 plate appearances over the last 11 plus months. Uh, obviously, he hasn't stayed on the field, but even in the time that he's been on the field, he really hasn't been the guy that we have known him to be over the last you know decade or so. Uh, his weighted runs created plus ranks for 33rd worst among the 349 hitters with at least 200 plate appearances in the span. Uh, his 33.1% strikeout rate also ranks 13th worst. During the span, he has a sweet spot rate of 23.7%, and that is the second lowest among the 395 hitters with at least 100 batted balls in this span. There are 395, and he ranks 394th. Uh, in sweet spot rate. Also in this span, his swing and miss rate on sliders and curveballs is 22.5%, and that is the 17th highest among the 309 hitters with at least 250 sliders and curveballs seen. And like Chris mentioned, that's not whiff rate. That is swing and miss rate. That means 22% of total pitches he sees, he swings and misses at. Uh, And from 2021 through 720 of 22, Uh, He had a 12.7% swing and miss rate against four seamers. And in this span, it is up to 18.6%, which is the seventh highest swing and miss rate against four seam fastballs among the 310 hitters with at least 400 or excuse me, 300 four seamers seen, Uh, you know, John Carlos Stanton, he's, you know, he is hitting 169 over his last 242 plate appearances, and he's lucky to have a 618 OPS with that batting average because luckily the power is still there. He's still hitting the ball hard. But, I mean, I think we are very clearly seeing the decline of John Carlos Stanton, both in health and in overall performance. And, you know, once the power starts to go, which, you know, it hasn't really happened yet. I mean, it's still not, you know, it's not 2017 level, but, you know, once that goes – it's going to be a very concerning contract for the Yankees to have over the next five seasons. Yeah, one hundred percent. John Carlos Stanton. Slightly alarming. Um, and yeah, when you know, going back to a conversation we had a, a few weeks ago, um, regarding the future Hall of Famers that are playing right now, um, you know, I I think I I definitely understand putting him like on a path or in the red zone based on the fact that he has like 45 wins above replacement. But I think the reason why I didn't even think of him was I think like lately just it's, it's been rough. And even going back to, you know, the start of his tenure with the Yankees, like, you know, heading into his heading into his tenure with the Yankees, it it was definitely like, he was definitely on a path to get into the hall of fame. But I think since, since, uh, Getting with the Yankees, he has maybe like five, six wins above replacement. Um, he and has yeah, 8. I mean, 9. this this, uh, this stretch that he has is uh, is not helping him whatsoever. So, um, yeah, and my my line of consideration for the Hall of Fame is fifty wins above replacement. He might not get there. I mean, he probably won't get there. I mean, he's at forty four point five. He needs he needs five point five more. Uh, and I mean, for context, since twenty nineteen. 
uh, it won't load, but he, I don't think he's eclipsed that. He, if he did, it's like barely there. Right. And, you know, he's a DH, so he's not getting any defensive, you know, mm -hmm. defense. That's yeah. not contributing to his wins of overplacement at all. It's going against it. He does still have a, you know, since 2019, he does still have a 125 OPS plus. Um, you know, the offense is kind of still there. It's, you know, like I said, it's not peak Stanton. You know, I think we've seen the last of him putting on like an incredible show throughout the entire season. You know, he did still hit 31 last year, but I mean, he had a 114 OPS plus and the 211 batting average and a sub 300 OBP, you know, like, well, like I said, the power is still there, but once that goes, it's very concerning. And yeah, 4.5 F war since 2019 or 4.5 B war since 2019. And he needs 5.5 more to get to 50. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like, yeah, we, we could see, we could be, yeah, very, we're, you know, we could very well be in the, in the decline of John Carlston and not wishing that on him, obviously, but like, that's, that seems to be based on the numbers, what we're seeing right now, he could get out of it potentially, but, um, as you mentioned, that's a really long stretch. That's a really long stretch right there. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So yeah, uh, unfortunate for Stanton and the Yankees, um, that that is uh, going on. Uh, my slightly alarming is another guy with a with a nine figure deal. Um, definitely smaller than Stanton's though. But uh, Marcus Simeon has been struggling as of late. Started the season really hot. Um, still overall on the year good numbers. But in his last fifteen games, he is hitting one sixty four with a four sixty six OPS and twenty two weighted runs created plus. Uh, out of 185 qualifiers in this span, his on-base percentage is seventh lowest, OPS is ninth lowest, and weighted runs created plus is also seventh lowest. And out of 46 hitters with 250 plus pitches seen in this span, his expected WOBA is the lowest. So he has the uh, the lowest expected numbers out of 46 hitters uh, with with the amount of pitches that he's seen. Uh, part of this can be attributed to how hard he's hitting the ball, his hard hit rate has gone from 43% down to 30%, uh, but also his sweet spot rate has gone from 39% to 25%. As we meant, you know, as we mentioned every every few episodes, sweet spot uh zone is eight to thirty-two degrees of launch angle. Uh hitters hit about 590 and slug almost eleven hundred in that area. So Simeon's sweet spot rate going down is very significant. That means he's not hitting it in that optimal zone as much as he used to. Uh, Marcus Simeon, uh, Marcus Simeon's non hard hit fly ball rate has gone from 16% before the span to 33% in the span. Uh, and for context as to why that is bad, the league is hitting 121 and slugging 166 on non hard hit fly balls. And Simeon has the most non hard hit fly balls in baseball in the span. He also has, uh, 25 nine. 25 non hard hit balls that are 33 plus degrees of launch angle. No one else has more than 16 and the league hits 057 and slugs 078 on those batted balls, those non hard hit balls that are uh, 33 plus degrees of launch angle. And Simeon himself is 0 for 25 on those batted balls. Uh, he also has a 44% rate uh, of those parameters, which leads the 239 batters with 25 plus batted balls in the span. So Marcus Simeon, in layman's terms, he is hitting the ball at less optimal uh, launch angles along with him uh, hitting the ball a little less hard. His strikeout rate has kind of remained the same, but uh, he's hitting more more balls in the air that don't really have a chance of getting out, you know, the non-hard hit fly balls, and he's, uh, he's seeing the results of that. So uh, Marcus Simeon. Slightly alarming. Um, so yeah, that'll do it for... Players to highlight for good and bad reasons. And now we will get into a preview of the weekend ahead where I will be looking at the series to watch. Daniel will be looking at the day by day starting pitching matchups. Um, and as far as series to watch, there are a lot of really good series to watch. Um, I'll just, I won't pick out a specific series, um, premier series to watch, but just going down the, uh, by, by the time they're playing, um, a really good series to watch here is the Reds are playing the Braves. Um, the Reds, as we mentioned, on an 11-game win streak, 
the Braves have the best record in the National League. It is a it is a uh, absolute clash that like I don't know if it would be that relevant. I believe the Braves are on a win streak as well. I mean the Bra- so when I mentioned that the Giants were like second in weighted runs created plus in their win streak, they were behind the Braves. Um, yeah, which is crazy to think like they've won. Uh, yeah, the Braves have won eight in a row. The Reds have won eleven in a row. Yeah, so that's one of their streaks is going to break uh, tonight, and uh, they'll play a three game series. And yeah, what, one thing I forgot to mention with the Reds is like they, I think D- Judgment Day is coming. Like they gotta they they gotta uh, play against the, um, they gotta play against the Braves. I think they have a series against the Padres in in a week, which I guess based on record isn't the biggest challenge. But they also in the middle of that play another tough team. They play the Orioles, so they have some tough teams coming up, and uh, we'll see how they step up to the challenge against the Braves. That'll be at Great American Ballpark. Um, another solid series to watch is uh, Yankees Rangers in the Bronx. A couple of playoff contenders going at it. Um, along with that, uh, Dodgers Astros. We'll see how how pissed the Dodgers fans still are um, at, the, yeah. at the Astros because that will be it's going been on at... four years. Actually, yeah. no, it's been six years. Six years since the scandal and and. Four years since uh it got reported. Um it broke, yeah. But uh but yeah, the Dodgers are hosting the Astros. No matter what, that is still a uh uh two of the best teams out there. The t- two teams I predicted would be, you know, near the top. I wonder what be. it's gonna take for like Dodgers fans to collectively move on. Yeah, I mean they already won a World Series, so Yeah. Like, they're they're and they're still not and the Astros happy. have also won another one, like you know clean yeah i mean we could we could just watch that series for those reasons to see how bitter they still are yeah Um, and uh and yeah and then the last series to look at is uh giants diamondbacks uh as we just talked about the giants they just wrapped up a 10 game win streak and the diamondbacks are the only team ahead of them in the national league west so uh we'll see how that pans out so those are the series to watch lots of them uh, what do you got for the day by day pitching matchups? So uh, tonight on Friday, Zach Eflin and Zach Greinke are pitching each other, uh, pitching against each other. A couple of Zachs in uh, Rangers and Roy- or Rays and Royals, excuse me. Um, Ken Maeda and Joey Wentz are facing each other in Twins Tigers. That'll be at Comerica Park. Um, Logan Gilbert is facing the Orioles for the Mariners in Baltimore. Uh, Kodai Senga and Taiwan Walker are facing each other in Mets Phillies in Philadelphia. That's Taiwan Walker facing his old team. Um, Chris Bassett is also facing his old team. He's facing the A's in Toronto tonight. Um, Shane Bieber is facing Wade Miley in Brewers Guardians. Um, yeah, in, in Cleveland. Um, Brian Bayo, who's pitched really well in his last few games, and Lucas Giolito will face each other in Red Sox and White Sox in Chicago. Uh, Patrick Sandoval will face the Rockies for the Angels at Coors tonight. Joe Musgrove will face the Nationals for the Padres at Petco. Uh, Logan Webb will face the Diamondbacks for the Giants in San Francisco. And matchup of the night comes from Pirates and Marlins. We're going with Luis Ortiz versus Jesus Lazardo. Yeah, that's a good stuff matchup. Absolutely. So then on Saturday, you have uh, Bryce Miller facing the uh, Orioles for the Mariners in Baltimore. You have Merrill Kelly facing the Diamondbacks for the Giants. You have... Uh, Luis Severino facing the Rangers for the Yankees. Jose Barrios facing the A's for the Blue Jays. Uh, James Paxton and Lance Lynn facing each other in the Red Sox, White Sox. Um, you have Freddie Peralta and Tanner Bybee facing each other in Brewers Guardians. Um, Bobby Miller facing the Astros for the Dodgers. Bobby Miller's been pretty awesome lately. Um, Pablo Lopez will be facing the Tigers for the Twins. Josiah Gray and Michael Walker will face each other in uh, Nationals and Padres. And matchup of the afternoon comes from London, where uh, Justin Steele and Adam Wainwright are facing each other uh, in the London series. I know that, you know, that sounds like a fun matchup, but I promise bet the over. Yeah, right, right. Uh, because <laughs> that, you know, I mean, it's only a two-game sample over the last, you know, and it was also in 2019, 
but I mean that park is a offensive machine. Yeah, I think I think the London Park factor is like one eighty four. It's probably m- more than that. Yeah, <laughs> it's wild. Yeah. Um, so on Sunday uh, at ten a.m., you got Marcus Stroman and Jack Flaherty facing each other in London. In Cubs Cardinals, the MLB just announced that the Mets and Phillies are playing there next year. I believe it was. Um, and also, uh, which teams was it? Was it the Braves and I forget which teams? But MLB is playing a game in Alabama next year. Interesting. Uh, yeah. It's at the oldest. Uh, okay, it's Cardinals Giants. That's what it is. Um, it's at a real. It's at a, a Negro League field. Um. And uh, yeah, they're honoring Willie Mays. Um, it's the oldest ball. I believe it's like the oldest ballpark, like in professional baseball. It's at Rickwood Rickwood Field in Alabama. That's really cool. Yeah, uh, the Cardinals Giants will be doing that in 2024. That's pretty cool. Um, anyway, on Sunday, George Kirby will face the uh, Orioles for the Mariners. You will have Garrett Cole facing the Rangers for the Yankees. Uh, you will have Tyler Glass now facing the Royals for the Rays. Bailey Ober will be facing the Tigers for the Twins in Detroit. Uh, Charlie Morton and Ben Lively, known innings eater, will face each other in Braves Reds. Johan Oviedo and Yuri Perez will face each other in Pirates Marlins. Perez has looked really impressive in his first few starts. Uh, Corbin Burns will face the Guardians for the or, yeah face the Guardians for the Brewers. Cutter Crawford, who's looked good recently, will face the White Sox for the Red Sox. Um, Anthony DiScalfani will face the Diamondbacks for the Giants. Mackenzie Gore will face the uh, Padres for the Nationals. Hunter Brown and Tony Gonson will face each other on Sunday Night Baseball. And a matchup of the afternoon, it, it pretty clearly comes from Mets Phillies. It is Max Scherzer versus Zeller. Zach, yeah, Scherzer versus Wheeler. Um, yeah, yeah, two of the best NLEs. Another former Met. Yeah, just a yeah former Met versus current Met and two, like they definitely, they, they uh saw, they definitely had matchups against each other on different NLEs teams when Wheeler yes. was a Met and Scherzer was, Scherzer a national. was a national. Yeah. And they probably also had at least one matchup where, yeah, a couple matchups where Scherzer was a Nat and Wheeler was a Philly. So yeah, there was, what, like a three-year window, two-and-a-half-year window? Um, or no, that would have been one-and-a-half half window. Yeah. Yeah. If you count 2020 as a full season. But, I mean, the yeah. they Basically were only one season. But, yeah, they were also only facing East teams, so the likelihood mm-hmm. goes up. But, yeah, that does it for yeah. this installment of Above Replacement Radio. We hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, if you are listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and want to watch the conversation as it happens or just check out our digital content in general, go to the YouTube channel and subscribe to the YouTube channel. It is called Above Replacement Radio. Uh, if you are listening on YouTube and just want to check out the audio only streams, go to Above Replacement Radio on both Apple Podcasts and Spotify and follow or subscribe to those streams. And if you want to follow us on social media, follow me on Twitter at Chris Under- at Chris underscore Gianta, follow Daniel on both Twitter and Instagram at Daniel underscore current and follow the show Instagram at above replacement radio for all the show needs. And we hope you enjoy this one. And we hope to see you next time where we will be talking all the happenings in major league baseball. Once again, see you then. This conversation, this conversation is over. Is over.